So today uh, we're going to talk about the church in Western Europe, and this is like crucially important to have a, an understanding of, of the Western European, now we will call it the Roman Catholic Church rather than just the Christian Church, the Roman Catholic Church that will dominate within Western Europe, because we now have to draw that line between what's going on in Eastern Europe with the Eastern Orthodox Christianity. The Catholic Church in Western Europe is going to be the only organizing force in Western Europe following the fall of Rome. So after we, after we lose the political entity of the Western Roman Empire, the only thing linking anybody with each other, because there is no political entity anymore that's linking peoples with each other in Western Europe, the only thing that we have linking people together in Western Europe, the only thing providing some semblance of organization and connection is the Roman Catholic Church. I want to talk for a moment about the organization of this Roman Catholic Church. We have at the top, the, all the authority of the church is vested in one individual uh, known as the Pope. And he lives, for most of the time, there's going to be one, one exception to this, he lives for most of the time in Rome. With cardinals and archbishops and bishops, uh, basically cardinals are just really high bishops. And archbishops are higher bishops and bishops are bishops. So with bishops leading regional entities, regional churches. And over time, some, most of the time, these, these bishops, these popes, these cardinals are going to be appointed, or pardon me, the, these guys will be appointed by the pope himself. And then it is amongst the cardinals that choose who the pope will be. All right? So the cardinals choose one of their own to who will be the next pope. You guys might remember this in recent history. We've done this a couple times within your life where the, the Council of Cardinals gets together in the Vatican. The Vatican City is like the, the home within Rome. Uh, it's actually like a sovereign independent state within the city of Rome. Um, the Vatican City um, will be, uh, there will be a meeting of the Council of Cardinals and then they will deliberate and eventually vote on who should be the next pope. Um, so the Pope is ultimately the authority, and then you've got priests, local priests, overseeing small local parishes or local communities. Within Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, there is strong missionary activity, just like we would see in, in Eastern Christianity, sponsored by, by the Pope, sponsored by the Church. Also a strong monastic movement, so an encouragement of monks, uh, taking religious orders and, and living a life in emulation of the life of Christ. And missionaries who will be sent out from Italy or from wherever Roman Catholicism has taken a stronghold to go out into areas where Roman Catholics aren't prevalent and try to spread the faith that way. And I think we said the other day, by about the year 1000, Roman Catholic Church has made it all the way up to the north into Scandinavia, and now we have Christmas trees. So you're saying by a thousand? By about the year a thousand, yeah. Uh, yep. As the uh, Roman Catholic Church missionaries are moving east, do they fly into the Eastern Orthodox Church? Yeah, they, don't, they tend to not move east as much, because um, the reality is, you, you go, when, when you're trying to spread a religion, it is best to go places where they don't have a strong, organized, universal religion. So, for example, to convince Eastern Orthodox believers to jump ship and become Roman Catholic, that would probably be very hard to do. They're already Christian, they just have a different way of, of practicing, and some small differences in how they practice. It's much easier, they're, they're going to find, it's much easier to go into lands where there is no strong, organized, centralized religion, like the pagan religions of Northern Europe, and, and try to convert them. Uh, by the same token... Islam. When Islam makes its way into India, it's going to have a harder time getting inroads into like the, the Indian subcontinent because Hinduism is so, so prevalent and so long-lasting there. Uh, but, but Islam will do much better making its way into sub-Saharan Africa, where there is no strong, central, organized religion. All right? 
So, boom. Politics in Western Europe. Everybody good? Notice, what do we talk about first? Church in Western Europe or politics in Western Europe? We talked about the church first. We want to remember that. Um, in Eastern Europe, we talked about the political leader before we talked about the church. And you guys all understand why at this point. All right, so when we talk about politics in Western Europe, um, it's, it's challenging because we don't have what Eastern Europe has in, like, one major empire that is going to expand its reach and have contacts with other states, but it's going to be the dominant figure, like we have the Byzantine Empire in Eastern Europe. In Western Europe, we don't have the same thing. Remember, with the fall of Rome, when Rome fell, it fell because, like, these, these Gothic tribes, these, these uh, Germanic tribes, are going to make their way down and ultimately bring uh, the city of Rome to its knees and, and collapse the Western Roman Empire. Well, those Germanic tribes don't have a semblance of a strong state like we've seen with other states, like in the Islamic Caliphates or in the Byzantine Empire or even in what Rome once was in the West. So in the absence of the Roman Empire, you get a lot of nothing going on in terms of state development. And people who care primarily about their own personal protection and the protection of their stuff often turn to, like, local authorities, all right? They become much more connected with local strongmen that can protect their things. Over time, we will have a larger political entity form in Western Europe, which is going to ultimately be known, as you can think of it, as the Kingdom of the Franks. The Frankish Kingdom. Obviously, what country will evolve out of the Frankish Kingdom? France. It'll be France. Very good. And I want to give you a guy to, to kind of just hear his name. Um, Charles Martel. Charles Martel. And if you want him to sound infinitely cooler and more tough, we will call him Charles the Hammer Martel. He got this name when he was doing the professional wrestling circuit in, uh, in the Frankish Kingdom. I'm kidding. He's Charles the Hammer Martel because he was a military leader and he was successful at being a military leader. And guess what you get to do when you are a successful military leader in these times? You get to lead states. You might have heard me mention Charles Martel's name because in the year 732, it was Charles Martel leading Frankish armies. Charles Martel leading Frankish armies to defeat the Muslim invasion into France at a battle known as the Battle of Tours, T-O-U-R-S, or sometimes it's referred to as the Battle of Poitiers, uh, P-O-I-T-I-O-R-S. So it, it happened like between the two of them. So the Battle of Tours, the Battle of Poitiers, Charles Martel was there and he was stopping the, the Islamic incursion into Europe. That's why the Muslims never push really beyond Spain uh, for the Islamic kingdom in Europe. It never makes it beyond Iberia. They try and they ultimately fail. And just geographically speaking, give me a reason why they're probably going to fail this. Yeah, well, they're, they're getting further and further away from their like base of operations, right? Like, the Islamic armies are pushed all the way across North Africa. They made it into the Iberian Peninsula. They've got these mountains to get through. These are called, anybody? The Alps. Not the Alps. The Alps are over here. The Pyrenees. the Pyrenees. Very good. They've got mountains to cross, and they're fighting a battle against a Frankish kingdom. Where? In the Frankish kingdom, in the Frankish lands. So... It's a tough fight to win. The Muslims are ultimately defeated there, and that's why they will never have a footprint larger than Iberian Spain. But that's one of those fun counterfactual things that you might want to think about. What might have happened? How could the world have been different had the Muslims won that battle? I have a hand here, then back in the back. What year was it? 732. This is not a crucial year to memorize or anything, but if it's in your head, it's in your head. Yeah. Um, I, I think you get a combination of two things. Again, geographically speaking, it's hard to lead armies over the mountains. Um, and then, in the, after the defeat, what this does is it starts to unify the Frankish peoples into one stronger entity, and they won't be able to, to compete against that. Um, it's not that the Islamic Caliphate is not maybe more advanced or stronger or anything. It's just 
that's a tough expedition to get in there. And now that you have a more organized entity to repel, they're going to do it. Now, Western Europe will have issues with Muslim invasions um, in another part of Western Europe, which we can kind of see on the map here. Uh, we don't have current national borders here, but this is Austria. And in the 1500s, you're going to have the Ottoman Empire at the gates of Vienna. Um, you know, and, and they will be duking it out there. They'll be held off ultimately. But Muslim empires do make it that far, but not for a few more centuries. All right. Um, so Charles Martel wins. He's the leader of this Frankish army at the Battle of Tours. He wins, and he becomes seen as now the leader of the Franks. He has a grandson. He's got a kid, of course. You can't have a grandson unless you have a son. <laughs> but his, his, you don't need to, don't worry about his son, but let, just hear his name. Pepin the Short. So those of you that are, are, are those of you that are, are horizontally challenged, or vertically challenged, horizontally challenged is, <laughs> yes, I don't know, maybe that, I don't even want to go what that could possibly mean. But vertically challenged, those of you that are vertically challenged, recognize that, Short individuals have done some pretty amazing things. Pepin the Short, he gave, well, he didn't give birth. Oh, man, I'm falling <laughs> off the rails right now. <laughs> but anyway, Pepin the Short's kid, his name is Charles. History remembers him as Charlemagne. Charles the Magnificent, Charles the Great. Uh, Charlemagne, C-H-A-R-L-E. M-A-G-N-E, Charlemagne. So all he did was just he was on help to... Yeah, well, I mean, there's a line here. There's a line. Charlemagne is going to be like the first major figure of Western European political history that you guys as AP World students need to know about. Did Pepin the Short do any invasions and stuff? You know what? I don't know much about Pepin the Short. So Charlemagne... He will expand his Frankish kingdom into territories further to the, the east, into what is today Germany. In the year 800, in the year 800, the Pope, on Christmas Day, December 25th, in the year 800, the Pope will place a crown upon Charlemagne's head. crowning Charlemagne as what is called the Holy Roman Emperor. Notice this Frankish kingdom still leaning back and calling himself the Holy Roman Emperor. The memories of Rome as, as the biggest, most powerful political entity are still strong. Remember, what is the Byzantine Empire still referring to themselves as, even by the year 800? Romans. So we're always wanting to hold on to this strong political tradition. So in the year 800, the Pope puts a crown on Charlemagne's head, and he will become the Holy Roman Emperor, the first Holy Roman Emperor. Now, the Holy Roman Empire is going to be around for a long time. Uh, my, my colleague, uh, Mr. Layson, before me, uh, would say that the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire is quite a misnomer. It's not properly named because the Holy Roman Empire throughout its history was not very holy, wasn't Roman at all, and was really a pretty lame empire as empires go. But it's going to be called the Holy Roman Empire, and Charlemagne starts it out. What's important to note about this image here is we have a pope putting a crown on a king's head, which gives us now the hierarchy, the political hierarchy in Western Europe. It's not that the pope has political power and he can tell necessarily Charlemagne how to rule his empire. Something to be said for the pope being the guy that is bestowing this honor onto this man, right? Whereas in Eastern Europe, we have the emperor of the Byzantine Empire deciding who essentially the pope is going to be, or who the, the patriarch, as we'll call him, of the Eastern Empire is. In Western Europe, you've got a complete flip around. And I want you to imagine what's going to happen down the road, centuries later, centuries later, the conflicts that could arise between this guy wanting to be the most powerful, and this guy wanting to maintain his authority. And that's going to be a, a strong issue of Western European politi or politics over the next few centuries. 
who's the big guy in town? Is it the Pope who crowns the king, or is it the king who rules the land? All right? There's going to be a lot of debates between this. Um, eventually, we're going to have kings, like a guy just foreshadowing, don't write this down, just hear it. A king in England, for example, um, Henry VIII, who wants to divorce his wife because she dare not give him a son, and he doesn't understand biology. <laughs> Henry VIII wants a divorce, but the Roman Catholic Church does not frown or does not smile upon divorces. And so as the church won't grant him the divorce he so desires, especially because his wife was a pretty big wig herself in the Spanish royal family at the time, because the Pope won't grant the, the divorce that he demands, he breaks off and he declares himself the leader of the new Church of England. And he goes all Byzantine now, that he as the king will be the leader of the church. And he can divorce his wives and chop their heads off and do all kinds of nasty things. Or, fast forward a few more hundred years, we come to 1800, right? We get a thousand years after, after this event happens. And the Pope goes to Paris, and he meets Napoleon to crown Napoleon Emperor of Paris. And Napoleon infamously takes the, the crown from the Pope's hands and puts it on his own head. Because in Napoleon's mind, no one should be above Napoleon. No one has the right to crown Napoleon except for Napoleon. But we will talk about these things as we push later in the year. Everybody good? All right. Unfortunately, kings die. Great kings die. And great kings' sons are often not great kings themselves. And so when Charlemagne passes away, his empire will be divided amongst his sons. His empire will be divided amongst his sons. Or, pardon me, grandsons. And this will ultimately weaken the empire as a whole, but you can kind of start to see something coming out of this. We kind of start to recognize some political divisions that we would note today. Like this kind of looks like France. And this kind of looks like... And this kind of looks like what will one day be Italy, all right? So Charlemagne dies, his empire is divided, and it will never have the, the strength or the unification or the centralization that his original Frankish kingdom had, all right? Um, you're going to come across it. The, the kingdom of Charlemagne is known as the Carolingian Empire, or the Carolingian dynasty, his line, the Carolingian. Carol is just a, another way to say Charles, okay? Um, so there's a, a famous actor from back in the day. Anybody ever hear of a guy named Carol O'Connor? No. Eh. He played a guy named Archie Bunker. He was a horribly racist guy in a sitcom in the 70s. Um, um, but he like, was really kind of groundbreaking for, it, for its time. Uh, and, um, and, and the point of Archie Bunker was, you could be this like horribly racist, nihilistic guy, but still have some love for your family, and, and people can still like you, but they don't have to like a lot of the things that you stand for. I don't know, there's more to it than that. But anyway, the guy's name was Carol O'Connor, and as I was growing up, I was like, the guy's name is Carol. Well, it's really Charles, so we're going to give him a break. Okay? Um, yes? Um, I, you said the Charlemagne um, Empire, oh no, I mean the... Um the, the empire, the Holy Roman Empire, was going to last for a long time. Yeah, so, so going forward, we're gonna, and we're not going to get in, this goes a little bit beyond the scope of AP World, but there's going to be later followers of Charlemagne who will proclaim themselves and be ultimately crowned Holy Roman Emperor. But remember how I said the Holy Roman Empire wasn't very holy, wasn't Roman at all, and wasn't much of an empire? It's really just a loose confederation of principalities. Um, and for our purposes today, we don't need to worry about that. Are we done? I was just checking to see what you guys Awesome. Like. Yeah, we're finishing up Western Europe today. And um, I hope to start Western Europe. Awesome. Hey, it's all good. It's all good. Um, so, so going forward... Smaller, in Western Europe, smaller, more regional monarchies are going to be the order of the day. Whereas in Eastern Europe, we've got the Byzantine Empire that's going to be around and kicking for a thousand years. Nothing quite like that in Western Europe. Smaller, regional monarchies with great political division. No unifying language. That's why there's like Spanish, Italian, 
in French, in German, right? Uh, so there's not a over over here. Remember, language makes it hard. If people speak different languages, it makes it hard to bring them together. Who's a who's a leader in world history that figured that one out? Let's get everybody learning and speaking the same way. Yeah. If you talk about Chin Shi Wang Di, yeah, uh, and and having a common written language. Yes, ma'am. Um, so isn't Charles and Louis? Are they like all taken as separate kings? Yeah, they they eventually like this is the division of Charlemagne's kingdom, but then they become their own kings of their chunks. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to uh, to fair. Um, there, yes, there will be, yes. Okay. They're all, and these are all Catholic. Go for it. Yes, sir. Uh, I was, I was going to say, like, I, they, I mean, you know how these, these kids, these borderline is kind of, kind of, uh, resemble to, like, today's yeah, countries? Yeah, roughly. I, mean, I, I think we can have, we can have it like, this, you know, this is part of the reason why, like, today, you'll get, there's, there's two, there's two continents have always been confused over why they were so, so divided, Africa and Europe. Yeah. Because they, they, they have so many countries living in a small land mass, so it's really dense. Sure. There's a disconnect to that because, like, for example, well, that's why Russia today is a really big country that's all that's like not really unified, but it's still a large has a large body mass. Absolutely. Because it's, it's uh, it wasn't really divided before. So it was like uh, it was a part it was the Byzantine like thing. Yeah, it was they, connected. It, really, Russia evolves out of Kiev and Rus, uh, but connected certainly to the Eastern idea. Yeah, but like today, like what is why like Western Europe, really Western Europe, and it's so like you see colors everywhere. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, last comment, Nina? Were there a lot of problems between, like, the two nations? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, they've, they've got political rivalries between themselves. Oh, no, I'm saying between oh. them and the Pope. What is that oh, and that, not that I, 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 that I don't know. Uh, that goes a little bit beyond me. Um, Did they ever fight each other? You know, and again, this is going beyond my area. I can't wait to get into the 20th century with you guys, because then, then I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. All right. Um, but anyway, for, for purposes of AP World, are we good? Yeah. Not, there's like no central political authority controlling much of Western Europe. There we go. Um, within these kingdoms, you get a lot of local landlords going their own way. And as we talked about the other day, that gives rise to the system known as feudalism and manorialism, being the, the chief political entities that Western European folks are living under. All right? These guys, Charles the Bald or Louis the German or Louis the Second or any that come after them, they have very, very, very little to do with, with the everyday lives of the people living within their realm. Like, you know how you guys have, like, very, like, Barack Obama today has very little to do with, like, your day-to-day -day life? Well, compared to the scope of world history, he is tremendously controlling, Right? Some of the things that Barack Obama and, and our federal government decide dictate really like how this building works, all the way up to and now and including the things we're allowed to eat during lunchtime. Going back for most of human history, most people have nowhere near that kind of contact with their central authority. All right, we're gonna finish up today with talking about the expansion of Western Europe and how over time, Western Europe is going to become uh, a stronger entity and ultimately, by the time we get into the next historical time period, the dominating power in, in certainly Europe, but ultimately the world. So over centuries, we got a lot of things going on in this map here. We got this like fluorescent green line. That is like the original extent of Charlemagne's kingdom. All right? How did they lose a lot of land? Well, it, it's just going to become, it, that'll still be a, a Frankish kingdom after that, but we're, now, it, now it is going to color the Holy Roman Empire going forward, so like the eastern part of Charlemagne's empire becomes, going forward, that Holy Roman Empire. But then you've got these Germanic knights, these Germanic knights in, uh, in Western Europe. Who, these are the Teutonic knights, you might have heard of this. Um, they're going to push further into Eastern Europe, and at times into places that, for, for example, Eastern Christianity might have been, uh, might have been prevalent. So you're going to get a push into Western, or pardon me, more Eastern Europe from Western European Germanic knights, spreading Germanic culture 
a little bit more to the east rather than staying where it was. So the colors don't make sense because uh, for Cold Land and Congress it's too high in the night, so we can't really see the difference because they're both red. And like, I mean, I see, I don't know if that color is red or pink up there. So yeah, mean, well, you've got the homeland is a very small little chunk here, and then they expand through the rest of what are known as the Baltic states. So are they, uh, are they serving or something? Or are they, are they no, they're their own thing. They're their own entity, but they're spreading Western European culture. So and they're Catholics as well. Oh, so are they like, uh, are, are, are like, uh, how do I say this? Are, are they, are they say today's Germans? Are they today's like, are they Anglo? Um, they're today's German Baltic folks. Poland? Like, lot, some Poles, some Latvians, Lithuanians. Because when I were thinking of Germanic at first, I was going to think of them as Israelites, because they're Germanic. Um, yeah, I would probably go to Germany first. <laughs> I'd probably go to Germany first. <laughs> <laughs> probably go to Germany first. <laughs> but anyway. Um, we'll also see expansion of, of Western European culture in Spain. And by 1492, an event known as the Reconquista is complete. If you are a Spanish speaker, you can say that even better than me with some rolling R's in there, probably. The Reconquista, the reconquest of Spain. By 1492. 1492 is a good year for young history, history students to remember. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And then I added on, this is maybe a line that my daughter won't say in her fifth grade uh, class. In 1492, Spain expelled the Muslims and the Jews. <laughs> it's a, it's a little, that's a little too hardcore for, uh, for elementary school history. So by 1492, you guys have probably heard of Ferdinand and Isabella. Those are like the leaders of Castile and Aragon that eventually marry and join that empire together. And together, they will be able to drive out the Muslims from Spain. What's that? In 1492, uh, Spain expelled the Muslims and the Jews. So, so Muslims and Jews were basically driven back into North Africa. They just like forcefully deport them out? You were fighting you, you're moving, or you're dying. Or you're converting. So, Catholic. so some might become Catholic, but remember what I said as well. Like, it might be easy over history. We see a lot of people with like traditional religions, or pagan religions, or animist religions, or or shamanistic religions. We see a lot of them converting to things like Christianity or Islam. But you don't as much see Christians converting to Islam. Or, or Muslims converting to Christianity, or Jews converting to either of them. It happens, but it's not as prevalent. Because they already have a universal belief system that says, my way is right, and every other way is wrong. And that's a hard thing to like, to, you know, I might wake up one morning and want scrambled eggs, and the next morning I prefer pancakes. That's an easy change to make. But to go one morning from believing, religiously speaking, like your world is set up to believe this order, let's say it's Islam, and then the next day being like, yeah, I guess I was wrong about that. That's harder to do. That's like a big change that, that is more rare. So primarily with the Reconquista, most of the Muslims and the Jews that were living in Spain at the time were either driven off the Iberian Peninsula into North Africa, or they were, they were killed. So... The, the Muslim conquest of the Iberian Peninsula was a violent military conquest. The, the Christian reconquest of Spanish Iberia was a violent military reconquest. All right. Wait. Yeah. But today, Spain is still, like, it's still Muslim, right? No. Oh. Spain, Spain becomes... Oh, sorry, that sound, that's going to sound more aggressive. <laughs> um, no, Spain becomes like, like the hyper-Catholic, spread Catholic at all costs uh, of nation of Western Europe. Uh, so like where all those Spanish explorers that we're going to talk about uh, within a couple, uh, meh, within a month and a half or so, with all those Spanish explorers that we're going to talk about, they are taking with them the Spanish crown. They're spreading the Spanish Empire, but they're absolutely taking in with them Catholicism. And one of the primary reasons they're going on these expeditions, in addition to strengthen the Spanish crown and bring in wealth, is to spread Catholicism. 
the Spaniards feel like they are warriors for, for Catholicism. Um, they're at the front lines of, of Christianity. And they feel like a special role in that because they had the initial role of driving the Muslims out of Spain. So they can pat themselves on the back and feel like they are defenders of Catholic Christianity. Uh, so no, Spain is very much uh, Christian and Catholic today. Hardly any Muslims or, or Jews within Spain today because of 1492. Yeah. Yeah. No, there were times um, for France. Did you say Spain or France? Yeah, there were times in history, we'll talk about it later in the year, where you could absolutely be punished and sometimes massacred if you weren't a Catholic in France, but they've lightened up on that stuff. Um, and, and that's not... It, France is one of... Well, a lot of Western Europe today. Um, there's less, far less religious connection or connections of individuals to organized religion today in Western Europe, and France is really at the forefront of that. A lot of atheist, agnostic people that just don't think about religion too much in Western Europe today. Uh, the United States, we, we are still a very religious country in comparison to a nation like France. Um, yeah. Have you seen Spanish Catholic? Absolutely. Mexico's Catholic. The Philippines are Catholic. Um, Venezuela's Catholic. Chile is Catholic. Colombia is Catholic. Panama is Catholic. Dominican Republic is Catholic. All of these places that the Spanish went, they're Catholic. Absolutely. Uh, Alex. So they did succeed in trying to try to swept uh, Absolutely. Yeah. They had they they pretty much did it by the by the sword. Absolutely. Yeah. Like uh, I don't know if I could last until today. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah. Awesome. Because when you convert like when you try to convert people by the sword, you I'm like I, I usually think of it as last long because Yeah, maybe, maybe. But there's gotta be something more there's there I, I think we could all agree that there's like Something more, like when we talk about the expansion of Islam and how many people like adopt, you, you can't get one and a half billion people to follow a faith, in my, this may be just my opinion here, or my editorial, I don't think you can get a, one and a half billion people to follow Islam because a thousand years ago they were a dominant empire and they were conquering other people. I think there's got to be something more in it. And there we talk about Equality of all believers and salvation, you know, and like like an eternity of, of salvation after after death. Uh, same thing with Christianity. Yes, a lot of Christianity spread through conquests, through military expeditions. But there's got to be more to Christianity to get two plus billion people to say, yeah, that's cool. Because there's a lot of people in the world today that are Christians that have never picked up a weapon in anger in their lives. So there's there's more to it than just the conquest. Yeah, because I, I just I just thought that it would force people to convert us in a certain way. It doesn't last long. It was like after you lose after you lose your uh, after you lose your influence, like for example, like the yeah. after Spain declined, so I thought they would go back to original. And they didn't. So that maybe is something to think about with an extended essay in your future. Uh, to think about the 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 role of of religion spreading by conquest but lasting. Uh, so there's got to be something more to it. But anyway, we're gonna we're gonna finish up here. Um, other expansions in Western Europe: the Vikings. The Vikings were Scandinavian peoples, and guys, all of these colors here that might look confusing from where you're sitting, they just represent the the extent of Scandinavian Viking settlement at different time periods. So this like blood red color here, that's where they originated: Norway, Sweden, Finland. Um, I don't know any easy way to remember that. Norway, Sweden, Finland is the order of those countries today. Norway, Sweden, Finland. Never share your fries. Oh, I love it. Never share your fries. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because your friends, they're going to say something like, oh, just give me a couple. But you know that just makes them want more, and they always come back for more, right? Right? And from personal experience, because I've been this guy. When you guys are old enough to drive, when you're old enough to drive and you go through the drive through and you're all ordering your extra value meals or whatever, beware that the person getting that food in the front seat and distributing that food is dumping some of your fries out of your container <laughs> to the bottom of the bag and they will make the call that they get all bottom fries 
It's going to happen in your fry. So if you are going through the drive-thru, you want to be in that front passenger seat so you can distribute. You get more. Never share your fries. Norway, Sweden, Finland. Thank you. That's going to be good. I like that. By the ninth century, they've got Scandinavians pushing further into Scandinavia and even in, 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 in England. Uh, even into Iceland by the 10th century. Now we get a guy like Leif Erikson that you've heard of, who's making his way all the way into the Americas, into uh, into Greenland. Is, um, yes. Is that why Greenland technically still belongs to Denmark? Yeah. 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 Early, early connections there. Now listen to me. Listen to me here, though. Why do we care so much more about Christopher Columbus than we do Leif Erikson? We're not. We're not talking about permanent settlements with the Vikings. If they were to have stayed and lasted for centuries, or not only went there and stayed, but expanded their reach within the Americas, well, then we'll talk about them, and then they would have been a really big deal, probably bigger than Columbus. But they didn't. They didn't last. And by the time Columbus is coming in 1492, the Vikings are long gone from, from Greenland. All right? So we've got Viking expansion. And then I want you to also notice, uh, by the 11th century, and then all of these like bright green areas are other areas that the Vikings travel in their, uh, in their river boats up the coastline all the way into the Mediterranean Sea and creating settlements in southern Italy. I think we think of the Vikings as very much a northern European entity. But the Vikings expanded throughout much of Europe, throughout much of Europe, and they were for a time a threat that all European civilizations had to deal with, Viking raiders coming in to try to take their stuff. And the last thing we're going to talk about before we head off to lunch, one last bit of Western European cultural expansion is going to be the Crusades. In the year 1095, and this is, guys, this is an important one to note for like modern history today. Because in a lot of rhetoric, for example, from Islamist organizations today, Al-Qaeda, like when, when Osama bin Laden was around and he was like a spokesman for Al-Qaeda, the United States was referred to in many cases as, or our, our armies or our soldiers were considered by these Islamist groups as crusader armies. We hear this a lot. A crusader is a soldier that went, in the Middle Ages, we'll give you a specific year in a second, that went to the holy lands of the Middle East to try to reconquer them from Islamic hands. In the year 1095, in the year 1095, the Roman Catholic Pope, a guy named Urban II, Pope Urban II, U-R-B-A-N, just like a city, Pope Urban II called for a crusade, called for Western European kings and knights to round up their men, to round up an army, and to head to the holy lands of Christianity. We're talking Jerusalem in the Middle East. In 1095, Jerusalem was, with, was in the hands of Islamic states. Yes, sir? We're talking about the first crusades. They're not here. Yeah, there, there are going to be a number of crusades. I only care about the first one right now. The idea was twofold. There were accusations of Christian pilgrims. And we used about the pilgrim word a couple times. I just read a book about Thanksgiving with my son last night, and he read about pilgrims. And we think of pilgrims with the hats and the buckles and the turkeys and the guns that go like, whoom, out, right? Those pilgrims are called pilgrims because they were on a religious journey. Just like the pilgrims of Islam making their way to Mecca to complete the Hajj are on a religious journey. Just like Christian pilgrims of the Middle Ages would go to Jerusalem on a religious journey so they could retrace the steps of Christ in his last days of life. While there were accusations that Christian pilgrims making their way to the Holy Lands were being persecuted or being, being threatened or sometimes being assaulted, it wasn't safe for them. So Pope Urban II calls for a crusade calls for Western European Christian leaders, Western European political leaders, to round up an army, to organize and fund a military force, to go to the Holy Lands, 
to fight Muslim armies there and to retake those holy lands for Christianity so they would be safe for Christian pilgrims. So with this call, you get French guys and British guys and German guys and, and some northern Spanish guys all heading to the Middle East to fight Muslim armies. And ultimately, they will, for a short time, retake Jerusalem. They do retake Jerusalem, only to lose it again uh, to a, uh, a leader named Saladin, S-A-L-A-D-I-N. Did they lost their land? Um, you know, I, I don't even know. In the early 1100s, they only had it for a short time. Why crusade? I want to give you three reasons why Western European guys would get on their horses or start hoofing it. Well, I guess if they're not, that's what they're doing if they're on their horses. Start walking to Jerusalem to fight. Three reasons. This is orchestrated by the Roman Catholic Pope. Catholic beliefs at this time said that if you did things for the Catholic Church, some good deeds, maybe sometimes giving of your finances, that you could be granted what are known as indulgences. It's important to hear this word because we're going to hear it again later in the year. In fact, yesterday was the day, not yesterday, today's the second, Halloween, October 31st, in the year 1517, was the day, for my Lutherans in the class are probably aware of this, that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of a, of a church in his hometown. And one of the things Martin Luther complained about to start the Roman, or to start the, the Lutheran Protestant faith, was that he thought it was insane that rich people could buy indulgences from the Roman Catholic Church. Essentially, you could pay to have sins absolved. So if you do some nasty sin, and you might otherwise be spending an amount of years in purgatory after death before you can be allowed to go into heaven. This kind of like middle world. You don't get to go into heaven yet because you've done some bad things. The church allowed you to receive what are known as indulgences. Absolution from these sins. So you could get the fast track to heaven. At some time, sometimes people bought it. Sometimes people gained indulgences. Uh, absolution from sins by doing deeds. Crusaders, if you went off to Jerusalem to fight the Muslims, you could be guaranteed a quick pass into heaven. Yay! It's a good way to organize an army, right? Make people fight for you because they believe they'll get into heaven faster. These guys also went to win the spoils of war. When you fight and you win, you get stuff. We call these things the spoils of war. You get loot or booty if you're a pirate. You get loot. You get maybe land. And so maybe a lot of poor Western European Christians thought they could have better opportunities going off on these ventures to possibly gain something in the Middle East. And then there's often talk about just a sense of adventure. You know, you could stay here and just keep tilling away at the land, or you could join with a bunch of guys and go on this like big camping expedition to the Middle East and fight for our faith. Awesome. That kind of sounds fun to some guys. Not me, but to some people. All right? Let me, let me have a couple last comments, and then we'll take all questions from you guys. These crusades, the first crusade was initially successful, but they would ultimately lose again. And then there would, over the next few centuries, be a series of other crusades. Some targeting the Holy Land specifically, others sometimes targeting Eastern European Christianity, Eastern Orthodox Christianity. But what's important to note about the Crusades is it's Western European culture heading to the Middle East and coming in contact with Islamic civilization. And when these two civilizations come together, Western Europeans are going to gain a lot. Because at this time, Islamic civilization is just coming out of its like high point, its peak of, of scientific inquiry, its peak of artistic development. Remember we talked about the Islamic caliphates, the Abbasid caliphate, holding on to all these Greek works of literature and preserving them? Well, guess who comes in contact with them when they went to Western, or when, when, when they went on the Crusades? Western Europeans, who may have not ever seen or heard of a lot of these things 
that the Muslims had held on to. Now they're coming in contact with it. They're coming in contact with medicine that's far superior to the medicine of Western Europe of the time. So Western Europe is going to get a cultural boost because of this contact with the Crusades. Now what about the Islamic world? It's a blip on the radar. All right? they must just, they're not getting much out of Western Europe. Now one, all they could possibly get is that which the Crusaders are bringing with them. And usually they're just bringing like their arms, their weapons with them. So there's not a lot of exchange there. But Jerusalem is a tiny, tiny city on the fringe of the Middle East, right? It doesn't have a whole lot of impact as to what's going on in the, in the uh, Anatolian Peninsula or in Baghdad, for example, or in Persia or in North Africa. The Islamic world is very big. This crusader conflict is very small. So we're going to wonder who gains from the crusades. Well, a lot of people die. But who gains? Western Europe gets a lot of cultural ideas from the crusaders, or from uh, the crusades, from the Muslims. Muslims don't have much to gain from Western Europe. We can also take a look at whose society, whose civilization was more advanced at the time. Probably the Islamic civilizations. So there's simply not as much for them to gain from Western Europe. 